next speaker, um, Chao Thewa. And Thewa is Lam is the president of the ACT Vietnamese Seniors Association uh, and a long standing volunteer social worker for the Vietnamese community. Le Hoa has also volunteered her time um, for the Vietnamese community for as long as she has been in Australia. And she's also a bilingual community researcher. Welcome, Le Hoa. Thank you very much, um, Pene. Um, yeah, as um, you have just heard the introduction from Pene, I would like to have a few words about myself. Um, on um, then I will we go into the um, topic of dying to know day. Um, I am Vietnamese Australian. I came to Australia in September the 11th, 1982 as a refugee. Um, I'm one of the 95,000 boat people that the Australian government accepted our status as refugees and grant us the visa to stay and live in Australia and call Australia is our second homeland. And I guess based on that very, um, yeah, um, emotional time for me as a young girl, I was only 22 when I left my country. That's how it um, inspired me to volunteer myself in helping the Vietnamese people who struggle with their language. Um, English is the second language in Australia. So I volunteer to help wherever I can. And so I have been doing that ever since I came to Australia. And it seems that's my calling. And um, I am married and we have seven children and nine grandchildren. And my now I share my personal experience um, about dying, death and funeral from my personal um, perspective, understanding and personal experience. So before I go to all of that, I just want to say thank you to Panay for um, inviting me um, and giving me this opportunity to share um, my uh, perspective, my personal story and how we is Vietnamese people dealing with um, dying um, relatives and um, members of the family and how the, the different, what is the difference between funerals um, conducted in Vietnam is for my memory of the 22 years that I lived in Vietnam because I've been living here longer than I did then. And um, I um, somewhat agree with um, Dr. Um, Rosalina that as a young child, I wasn't allowed to attend funeral um, um, ceremonies of um, people in the village, in town, unless they are the immediate um, members of the family. And especially as grandparents, I remember my first experience with um, funeral was for my paternal grandfather. And it was, really big, really big ceremony. I remember I was startled to see how many people um, attended my grandfather's funeral wearing the white headband. And that signified the direct um, connections with the deceased person. And it has certain differences in the characteristics of the costume that will tell others the, out, um, the guests um, who are the, um, the daughters or sons of the deceased or and who's the in-law children. So all of that for me, as young as I think I was about six, I asked a lot of questions and I was told this is a funeral so I shouldn't ask who's wearing this and that sort of stuff. And, um, and it's, it's a very um, solemn ceremony is um, the music that he, um, for all Vietnamese funerals in Vietnam, that organized in Vietnam, they have, um, they always employ, um, they call it funeral music, musical band to play at the funeral. And the, um, yeah, the songs, and not, not, not the song, just the instrumental um, 
music. It's very sad. The whole town would hear it. The whole village would hear it. And it seems to me that's like an announcement of this family who just had someone who passed away. And in our culture, it's a very tightly, not just tightly knit family, but also with the community in which we live. So normally wedding is a very private ceremony. Only those who invited um, receive the, the invitation would attend. But for funeral, everyone who hear the music play, they know there's a funeral um, in town, they would come to pay tribute to the deceased person. And if that is an, um, of, um, someone who held an important position, there would be other ceremony held separately as well. But normally they have it held in the private home. So we're talking about the differences between the funeral um, in Australia, how it's organized and the funeral, how it's organized in Vietnam. And also how the Vietnamese Australian organize their funeral in Australia. So to me, there's a different aspect that um, is very helpful to, to know so that we understand a little bit more about how other cultures that, um, because we are a multicultural country. So we have seen like um, Panay, uh, Dr. Rosalina have just shared how the funeral um, arranged and conducted in um, Samoa and uh, Fiji. And um, yeah, from my memory, I, I remember it's, um, it's a very big thing. It's very sad event, but um, the music and the number of people, and they normally kept in the private home. They have the coffin um, stay in the home until the burial um, or cremation ceremony day. That's when it's transferred in the special, um, what you call here, it's like the, um, the car that trans transport the coffins, the, um, the herds. Yeah, but in Vietnam, there's a special car that is also decorated and people know it's the funeral. Um, yeah, and um, so, the number of people attend the funeral in Vietnam is also very different to the number that you would see in Australia. For Australian um, funeral is a very, to me, as I understand, as I've been told, it's a private um, function of the family. So it's only immediate family members would attend or friends who received the invitation to attend the ceremony would come. I have been told that, you know, you don't just turn up to anyone's funeral, even if you know them. So I feel, oh, it's a bit sad, but you know, unless the family know you, the deceased person, although you knew the deceased person, you don't go. And I, I guess later you can ask me question or I might even have some questions for you, Panay, if you have the answer. And um, yeah, in, um, in Australia, the, the Vietnamese people would have had a limited number of people, depends on the, the room. Like here, most funeral um, will be organized at um, a rent at the funeral directors and depends on the size of a room, then the family would normally send out a note said, you know, because due to the limit of the area. So we, that, 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 that is why Vietnamese Australian people organize the viewing time on a consecutive two, three, four days, depends on their estimate, um, estimation of, you know, how well known their deceased member in the family to the community. And even people um, from in the state come to attend the funeral as well once they hear. So we have a very, um, I guess, it's a very closely knit um, community inter in the state as well. Like, you know, people, um, most Vietnamese people who come to Australia um, 
have been granted a status as refugees. So therefore, we recognize each other as um, members of a large family who's diverse from our homeland. Now we come to live in Australia, we call Australia our second home. So if we hear someone who we used to know live in the same village and yet now living in a different state and that person dies and we just buy a ticket and attend the funeral. Yeah. And um, that, I guess I'm just going to the point that I'm supposed to be, uh, that's a funeral, and how we're talking about dying and death from our culture. For Vietnamese, um, the, the, the death is something that they don't talk um, openly, although we all accept that because we know dying is part of our life journey is inevitable, um, happen to everyone. And um, Vietnamese, in the Vietnamese family, um, children don't normally allow to hear about the dying grandparents or anyone that, you know, they aged so they died or suffering from a terminal illness. They avoid talking about that just to give the children the peace of mind. But as adults, we prepare for the day that our aged senior relatives in the family, particularly grandparents, dying. So I guess it's a different um, attitude and a different um, frame um, of mind. So they accept that easier. And um, of course, the religious belief hey, will play an important part in the process of dying, leading to the death of a person. And Vietnamese people is well known um, for Buddhism as the main religion uh, of our um, country. So majority of people who, whether they are practicing Buddhists, are just ancestor worshippers, but the funeral mostly will be uh, known, well known is conducted according to the Buddhist um, um, regulations, laws, or uh, rules. Yeah, they would invite an abbot to um, um, chant the, because I, I am a Christian, so I, we, we don't organize the um, funeral um, like other Vietnamese people, but I attended the funeral and the viewings of many um, friends and people I knew in the community. So that would go for two, three, four days and the immediate family who would bear the, we would call it the, wearing the white band that characterize the immediate family that will have a ceremony where the abbot will distribute the, the band to the family at the first day of the viewing time and following the burial or cremation um, ceremony, people will have seven consecutive ceremonial service conduct at the temple, the, the Buddhist temple, is they believe that the spirit of the deceased person will lingering um, with the family, particularly with those um, the deceased person loved the most. So they just want to make sure that the living ones will not be grieving to the point that he or she becomes so sick because of the spirit of the deceased doesn't want to leave. So therefore, the seven consecutive ceremonial uh, service that happened at the temple would release the spirit of the deceased. And it's interesting to hear Dr. Rosalina mention how majority of the um, Samoan and Fijian are Christians. Am I right? Um, and therefore, the belief of, um, I think that's a very important part for me personally, which I will um, share uh, later, 
that is um, in, in my talk, that is um, in for the Vietnamese culture, most people believe in reincarnation, uh, which is the life that we live at present is the indication of how we had lived in the former life. And of course, for a, a lot of people, particularly now with the Vietnamese born overseas, they question their parents and grandparents and they don't have the answer, of course, because it's all just the speculations, the hypothesis based on their religious belief. So they will, that is also tied to the funeral um, services. They will talk about how the life that this deceased person has lived, they hope and pray that he or she, the deceased person, will enter the next level, a higher level of life in her next life, which will be better. There's a funny story when people are talking about, oh, you hate animals, perhaps because in a former life you were that animal. And, and it's kind of funny, and I couldn't fathom that thought. And a lot of people say if the dog bark at you because in the former life you ate too many dogs. And I thought, oh, that's a bit strange. Anyway, so reincarnation is kind of um, something a bit tricky, but uh, there's no um, docu um, documentations or no, no one can prove that belief is correct. So, but we're not talking about right or wrong here. We just accept the cultural. Um, effect and religious input in the dying, the death, and the funeral, how it differ between people in the West and in, in, in Asia. Yeah, I guess the funeral um, very much similar to Thai and Chinese and Korean people, it's just a difference is the, 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 the songs that they were sing and the costume that they will wear. So now we come to the point that we, um, that my personal um, experience of um, death was with my um, father. Whom I care for until my father's last breath. <clears throat> my father was diagnosed with lymphoma in 1991, which was a year after they arrived in Australia um, as we sponsored my parents out um, seven years after I came to Australia. So it was a very sad time for me knowing that you know my dad just arrived in Australia and now he was diagnosed with a terminal illness. <clears throat> so to me the the personal experience of caring for someone who's really close to me and watching him going through all the treatments and then later was were told that no further treatment my dad can receive. It was a very hard time. And I guess I shared about this with some of my friends who, um, who are not Asian, but not necessarily Australian. They came, they migrants from different part of the world. They said, um, death is something that um, people don't want to talk about. And so for me to share how I miss my dad or when they ask around my mom and dad, I feel like they, they don't want to hear it. So I thought, Oh, okay. Uh, people don't want to hear about death. And um, I, I was a bit sad. So I feel like I should cry by myself. I cry because I'm the only child in Australia. All of my other brothers and sisters, they live overseas. And my mom and dad, I'm the only, I'm the, the, only um, the, the youngest child. Um, my other brothers and sisters are half brothers and sisters. I only have two um, blood brothers with, uh, um, from my parents um, still in Vietnam. So for me to care for my mom and dad, 
during that time, I believe that freely crying and accepting the fact that terminal illnesses like my death days have been numbered. Um, it helped me to accept the day that I know my dad didn't have long to live. And as a Christian, I, my dad was very, very calm. Um, he suffered a lot, but he comforted me when he could still talk. We'll see you again in heaven. So I think to me with that um, blessed assurance as my dad believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as his savior and so do we, that we have that hope, the definite, the, the assured hope that we will see him again. And it's such a comfort for my children and myself and my husband to know. So we um, did all we could and we don't have the, the I, I, I guess the, the emotional grief to the point that some of my Vietnamese friends who lost their parents through terminal illness, they, um, it was a, a very terrible experience for them, is the, to them is um, this, it's a separation that a farewell that they feel they lost their parents forever. So, and then the same, um, I think it's the, the, the point that um, when I spend time to care for my father who was diagnosed with terminal illness, then passed away and I did all I could, that really relieved me from the grief, the tremendous, the uh, a heavy hearted grief that I knew um, if I hadn't done all I could for my dad, then I would regret. Now, this is what happened to my mom. What is different? My mom died in her old age. My dad passed away when he was only 75. So it was, yeah. And my mom, on the other hand, she passed away resulted from her um, sudden heart attack, which she never had any cardiac problems. She had that um, heart attack brought on as a result of a very short time, mom suffered heartbroken situation is I took mom to Vietnam to visit my brothers and she was treated very badly by my prodigal brother. And emotionally she was heartbroken. So when she returned to Australia, it brought about her passing. So I, until now, my mom passed away in 2009. When I look back, I regretted that I took my mom to Vietnam and allow her to stay with my brother for a short time. So I guess now I have to learn to forgive myself because the death of the loved one caused by whatever the reason, then we, the loved one who knew. So either you accept that and then say, okay, you know, dad had lived a good life, mom had lived a good life, but the cause of their death sometimes lingering in our mind, I guess, until the day we pass. And for my mom, I also thank God that I have this precious hope that I'll see my mom again. And personally, talking about uh, life and death is something that um, Vietnamese people um, accepted, and I guess most people know that uh, dying is part of life, is the reality that we cannot avoid it. We can avoid talking about it. We don't. We can avoid not thinking about it. But why let it to um, suppress our life at present? by fear. So for me, if people ask me, um, how do you feel if, um, I, I have some very blunt friends who said, um, are you afraid of death? And I said, no, it's part of life. We just have to um, accept it and prepare well while we're living. So that is what to me, this is the beauty of living in a country that people encourage you to go and buy what they call it funeral plant. So that when we pass, 
the financial cost will not be a burden to our family. And um, we even prepare for the funeral ceremony. Uh, I would, um, I have already set our children, we choose it to be the um, celebration of mom's life or celebration of dad's life rather than say funeral. Yeah. So um, I guess this is now I um, would like to um, leave it for uh, Panay if you have any um, questions for me. Thank you, Fanay. Thank you, um, everyone, for listening to my story and my uh, perspective regarding dying day that we all need to know, dying death and funeral. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Fanay. Uh, um, that was um, for sharing that personal um, story and um, sharing your personal perspective of um, death and dying in the Vietnamese community. We have a, a, a question online and it's um, for Vietnamese people with traditional beliefs and culture who are dying in Australia. What do you think are the most important things to bring them peace and comfort as they're dying? Mm -hmm. For my personal experience, the, um, the presence of their loved ones, the frequent visit during their, um, you know, it, it, it depends on if it's a terminal illness, then people can prepare for, you know, can organize for visit. So that's the comfort for the dying member in the family so family visit friends visit is a great comfort for the person as well as for the family um, of the dying one because they know that um, the saddest day is drawing close so when people um, giving them phone calls and pay that frequent visit it's a great comfort. I hope that that's the answer that you're looking <laughs> Thank you. And it is. It is um, a, a, a time where family and friends and those close to you are, are welcomed and, um, and, and bring you that, that peace yeah. and comfort during those yeah, times. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have another question and perhaps you talked a little bit about it with um, with the afterlife, but mm -hmm. the, are there beliefs for um, afterlife with the Vietnamese um, culture? I think you talked a little bit about it, but if there's mm. anything else you would like to add, that would be wonderful. Uh, right. Um, I guess it um, depends um, on the um, each individual um, and their religious belief, of course. Um, like some of the young people these days, I talk with them and they don't believe in afterlife. So they just said when a person dies, that's finished. And um, they, they seem to be kind of skeptical about the belief in spirit. But I guess that is the topic that we're not going to go in is um, for, you know, a different um, time. But for me, um, I believe um, not about afterlife as a reincarnation as in Buddhism, but I believe that um, afterlife is either life in heaven with um, the loving God or life in the very sad place that... Um, I'm aware that a lot of people avoid talking about it, but it's the reality they, they, they call hell. So we said, well, now look at the present time that we're living, this certain situation, people have said, what a hell. So, you know, so I said, what do you call that hell? You know, for my curiosity, I didn't mean to be um, difficult or just mental. I said, why are people saying that? I said, oh, just a saying, because I, we, I, my children are all born in Australia. So sometimes they acclaim and say, what the hell? So I said, darling, what do you mean? What the hell? <laughs> so there you go. So for me, uh, I'm looking forward to, yeah, that being heaven. Thank you. That's personal. 
<laughs> Thank you for that. Um, are there any more questions? If, if there's um, no other questions, just um, I think Lewa and um, Rosalina have just sort of shared their personal stories and um, perspectives on death and dying. And I think what Rosalina had said um, it, it seems to, to, to flow through um, different cultures is that death um, um, and services and funerals is an affirmation of familial ties and kinships and it brings together um, people, uh, friendships and loved ones. Um, and it also mm. honours and celebrates the life of those who have passed and mm. then finding those ways um, to sustain and maintain hope for those who have been left behind. And I think those are some beautiful um, ways of, of looking at it from, from the talks that we've had today. And yeah, just again, um, our heartfelt thank you to our speakers, Faftai Terelava Kam Ung, and um, for sharing your your stories and um, and hoping that your stories and your perspectives have enriched our understanding of the differences in um, in what we 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 in Australia um, come through with death and dying. Um, thank you to our wonderful um, audience. Um, we will send you a uh, follow-up email or, um, and these will be put on online for viewing if you need to. And um, really, really wonderful to have been part of this, of these webinar services and, um, sorry, these, these webinars. And please, uh, we've, we do have our survey that will help us improve these services um, and our HCCA services. So if you can complete one, that would be wonderful. But once again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your of, of this beautiful sunshine day here in Angamal country. Thank you.